I guess it's my turn, huh? Nick forgot to call me and tell me. <laughs> a couple of songs you heard this morning, I had requested a couple of weeks ago for Nick to play. That last one on Wings of a Dove is one of my favorite songs of all time. It's by Berlin Husky, and it's just, I don't know, it just kind of explains how really it is. And I appreciate you doing that, Nick. That's kind of a short notice. Let's give the band a hand for what they do. My goodness. How's the family this morning? I'm not going to forget to say that. I guarantee you I learned my lesson on that one. How many of you walked out here last week and said, hey, I'm going to remember that message because Reggie said he played a video and he wanted to make sure it made an impact on somebody to remember what a Transformer looked like. How many of you remember that? Absolutely. Well, we're going to do something similar to the same, but not quite as far as we're going to go there. Yesterday, I attended the men's prayer breakfast over at Ellis County uh, Cowboy Church and uh, was asked to bring the devotional uh, for that morning. I, I really enjoy my time there because I get to visit with uh, men that I haven't seen in a long time when I was over at Ellis County. A lot of them still still there, and they come to that breakfast. And, of course, they, just like my wife, they throw me under the bus, run over me two or three times, and make me enjoy my, you know, show me that they appreciate me being there and I really enjoy that. I get to catch up on what's going on in their lives that, you know, I might not know because I don't get to visit with them a whole lot and kind of got caught on that. And my devotional was uh, on being an encourager to everyone. That was basically what it was about. And while putting the devotional together, I found myself reflecting back on people that I had encouraged from one time or another but I found myself also thinking about how in some cases these people, because of the sins that they have in their life, had caused their own problem. But I was still called by God to encourage them, even though they, they created a lot of their own problem. And it was the sin that they just didn't seem to get rid of in their life. But, you know, even though you're encouraging them and you think that, sometimes you just have to say, hey, maybe you ought to look on the inside you know, and see what's going on or really talk to God about this. You don't go in and condemn somebody for that, but a lot of people do, and we've talked about this before, is problems going on in their lives, and many people have problems every day. But if you stop for a minute and look and think about it, some of the problems you got going on in our lives are caused by us, and we created them. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. So we know that people are going to have problems. We know they're going to cause problems in their own lives. But we are still to encourage them and help them get past it. And maybe reflect Jesus Christ to them so they will seek to get rid of that sin in their lives and stop creating their own problems. So this morning we're going to talk about a man called Balaam and his talking donkey who created his own problem because of the sin in his life also. So I got I, some of you that are a little older, you're going to remember these. I have three famous animals that I'd like to see if you're familiar with. And some of you, uh, it's from uh, uh, our younger generations, and some of it's from the older generation. The first one's uh, Francis. And Francis uh, basically was a talking mule and uh, was a live character, believe it or not, who became a celebrity in the 1950s on many... Uh, war shows or, or army shows and um, was a movie star in seven popular comedies. So any of you that's my age or, or, or older, you're going to know who Francis is. Will you play that clip for me, Ron? For you that don't know who Francis is, we're going to give you an example here. Well, then why aren't you doing something about it? I am. I'm telling you. Me? Why? You know what section you're in? Well, certainly. I'm in G2, intelligence. Then don't sound so all fired surprised when I give you some. Basically, the show was about a, a man in the army, and he had this mule that talked to him all the time and actually helped him sometimes and gave him instructions, but the, the mule was a little cocky, got a little, you know, a little rough with him sometimes. But that's one of our, our talking celebrities. The next one you may know, it may get a little bit closer because... We're going to talk about Mr. Ed. How many of you know who Mr. Ed the talking horse is? There we go. And once again, Mr. Ed was a live character 
who became a television star in the 1960s in a show called Mr. Ed. You do that for me, Ron? <coughs> when I get up for breakfast, there's no oats in the bin. Cause everything is going out and nothing's coming in. Believe me when I tell you, I have heard the news. I got those empty feed bag, empty feed bag blues. My pretty filly told me to stay away tonight. Cause all that I bring with me is a healthy appetite. Why am I so unlucky? Me okay, Ron. with four horseshoes. So you get the idea. Now both of these characters, both of these horses, they used uh, little cheap special flat effects during that time to get them to talk. What they did is they put peanut butter in their mouths. And that's how they got them to seem like they were talking and they put the voices to them. Now I'd like to move a little bit further forward uh, to, to today and uh, maybe relate to some of the younger folks here. They'll know who I'm talking about. There was a talking donkey named Donkey. Donkey, am I saying that right? From the popular animated movie Shrek. You give me that one? Donkey, is that how you... Yeah! Waffles! And I thought the Waffle Fairy was just a bedtime story. Sticky stacks of golden therapy deliciousness! Donkey, <gasps> don't eat that. Mm. There's a stock of freshly made waffles in the middle of the forest. Don't you find that a wee bit suspicious? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're gonna... I'm just... What are you... Mm. Bad donkey. Mm -hmm. Mustn't. Mm. I said don't. Don't. No. Get away from it! You're dead. Mm. Ah. Uh-oh. Look out! Ah! Donkey! Are you okay? I'm fine. Ah! Did he create his own problem? That fit perfect. Perfect fit. You know what all four of these animals have in common is they all talked. Or at least they appeared to talk through special effects and film. But the book of Numbers... In our Bibles, we find that Balaam's donkey really did talk, according to the Bible. Amen? And I know, you can take this up now, bring the lights up. I know that uh, some of you are thinking, could a donkey really talk? Is that possible? But you need to remember one thing in the Bible, in this story. God can make everything out of nothing. And making a donkey talk would be very simple for him. Amen? The Bible does not reveal the name of Balaam's donkey. We don't have a name there to put with it. But we know that the owner was Balaam. And we know that the donkey was female, not male. Now guys, don't read nothing into that. Because that doesn't have anything to do with the talking part. I'm trying to calm it down. I'm not trying to start it. Turn with me this morning, if you would. We're going to Numbers 22, verse 1. <laughs> Created my own problem. You're right. So. We're going to pick up at Numbers 22, verse, uh, chapter 22, beginning at verse 1. Numbers chapter 22, beginning at verse 1. Then the Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan and across from Jericho. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, was, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was terrified because they were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. The, the Moabites, <laughs> Moabites said that to the elders of the Midian, this horde is coming to lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at the time, sent messengers to summon Balaam, son of Bor, who was at Pether near the Euphrates River in his native land. Boy, I'm getting tongue-tied on that one. Balak said, 
A people has come out of Egypt. They covered the face of the land and they settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that whatever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse is cursed. The elders of Moab and Midian left taking with them a fee for deviation. When they came to Balaam, they told him what Balak had said. Spend the night here, Balaam said to them, and I will report back to you with the answer the Lord gives me. So the Moabite officials stayed with him. God came to Balaam and asked, Who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak's son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent this message. A people that has come out of Egypt covers the face of the land. Now come and put a curse on them for me. Perhaps they will be able to fight them and drive them away. But God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. The next morning, Balaam got up and said to Balak's officials, Go back to your own country, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the Momonite officials returned to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Then Balak sent the other officials, more numerous and more distinguished than the first. They came to Balaam and said, This is what Balak's son of Zippar says. Do not let anything keep you from coming to me, because I will reward you handsomely and do whatever you say. Come and put a curse on these people for me. But Balaam answered, Even Balak, even if Balak gave me all the silver and gold in his palace, I could not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of the Lord my God. Now spend the night here so I can find out what else the Lord will tell me. That night God came to Balaam and said, Since these men have come to summons you go with them but only but do only what I tell you verse 21 Balaam got up in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the Momonite officials but God was very angry when he went and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him Balaam was riding on his donkey and his two servants were with him when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand it turned off the road and went into a field Balaam beat it to get it back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path through the, vineyard, through the vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. So he beat the donkey again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it lay down under Balaam, and he was angry, and he beat it with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and it said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You have made a fool of me. If only I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road, with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and he fell face down. The angel of the Lord asked him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I've come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If it had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now, but I would have spared it. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now if you are displeased, I will go back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went with Balak's officials. Good story. Good story. He basically had been offered money to do something. He had become, I think it said in here, he had become a hired gun for them. You know, that he could go out and do their dirty work for them. He wanted, uh, Balak wanted to have them cursed. So, you know, Balaam's sitting here thinking, well, you know, there's a lot of money involved because they brought a lot of cash. There's a lot of money involved. So maybe I really would like to do this even though the Lord's telling me not to. And because of Balaam's sinful greed, the Lord made it more and more difficult even though he told him to go ahead with them. And he made it really difficult for him to do. Balaam basically made his living off people who paid him to place curses or blessings on other people. And apparently he's really good at it if people are looking out to hire him to do it. Some of that had to be coming true, evidently, or they 
believed in it more than anything else, but they were willing to pay him and pay him a lot of money to have that happen. And Balaam's problem was that his sinful greed was pitting him against God and God's will. His sinful greed was causing him the biggest problem. Balaam was tempted by a load of cash. Man, I got all this money. That What they're offering me, I, I, I can probably retire. I don't even have to do all this stuff anymore because I'm going to have all this money. You know, what is it? He was being tempted. Tempted. And he knew all that money, you know, if they were offering it, he was willing to take it. But he had to figure out how to work with God and work with Balak to get this money away from them. So maybe he could make them both happy, right? In the essence, it all came down to him. It didn't have anything to do with either one of them. He was looking out for himself. And he knew, Balaam knew that God had said, he also, he knew that God knew that he also wanted the money. Because God knows exactly what's going on in our heart. Amen? So God already knew what was going on here. And he knew because Balaam did not send the men away at the very first like he told them. He told them, he said, send them away, and then Balaam didn't do that. He invited them to stay one more night. Let me go talk to God one more time. Let me go talk to God one more time. Maybe I can make this work. Well, he was looking out for himself, and God knew the minute he didn't send them away that, you know, he was kind of what we'd call here at Cowboy Church. He's kind of on the fence. He's straddling the fence. He's trying to figure out, man, I, how can I get both? You know, how can I do both here? Sometimes we do that. You know, we know we want it our way, but God wants it a different way, so we'll climb up on that fence and straddle it for a little while. And, but right here, right here when he did that, that's when he created his own problem. When he tried to go against God's will, and he decided he'd straddle the fence until he could figure out how to get what he wanted out of it. And he wasn't only going against God's will and not doing what God told him, he was trying to get God to okay it. He was trying to change God's mind and make God see that it was okay because he wanted it his way. He wanted to make it where he could get it all. Sometimes, don't we do the same thing? Maybe on a smaller scale. Maybe not quite as out there as having to run into a talk, talking donkey, but don't we do similar to the same things from time to time? We call on God for direction. And when God does not give us the answer we want, we start negotiating with God and trying to get our own way. I've seen this happen several times and probably done some of that in my own life. Never works out right, does it? Usually we ignore God because the sin that we have going on seems more pleasing than what God has offered. Do we really know what God's offering? No. That's the problem here. God's trying to prevent us from a future problem. He sees what's coming down the road. We don't. And sometimes He doesn't give us what our, we want or He doesn't answer us in the way that we want because He doesn't want to see that problem created, that problem or burden in our life. He can see it coming when we can't. And that's why sometimes we'd rather... Rub up against that little sin just a little bit, you know, and, and stick with it. Or we'd rather negotiate with God and say, hey, you know, I know you're all powerful. I know you're, you have all the wisdom and, and everything, but I think I can do this. This will be okay. Don't tell me you don't do that. People do it all the time. And they're getting ready for a fall. The minute you do that, the minute you go against God's will or God's word, you're in trouble. Just as Balaam did just as the little donkey did right there in the, in the field. Create your own problem over and over again. If we continue to read in Numbers, we find that God sent Balaam on with the king after he finally calmed the donkey down. Now, we know God's got to love animals because the first thing he talked, the first thing he said to Balaam, why are you beating this donkey? He's not your problem. I'm your problem. You know, and, and I guess God's thinking, Balaam, through all this whole thing, what part of no do you not understand? I guess I could ask you that today. When God talks to you and He says no, 
don't do that, don't go there, and you continue, what part of no do you not understand? God said no. It's kind of like your kids coming up to you. No matter how many times you tell them, they keep going on and on and on. Sometimes we say, because I said so. Well, that's probably not a good answer for a kid, but when God says, because I said so, hey, yeah, okay. First of all, if I had a donkey talking to me, I'd hit my knees and start praying right then. I wouldn't need all that blockage. <laughs> Got my attention right then, amen? If we continue to read in Numbers, though, we find that God sent Balaam on with the king right on down the road. But every time the king tried to get Balaam to curse Israel, Balaam blessed them instead of cursing them. Everything that came out of his mouth was a blessing. And you can imagine the king sitting there thinking, what's this all about? So basically, all at once, God's done messed up his little cash flow right here. Because he's not doing what, what he's going to get paid to do, right? Because God's not allowing it to happen. Turn with me to, uh, we're there in Numbers. Let's skip over to 23, uh, chapter 23, picking up verse 11. Numbers chapter 23, verse 11. Balak said, to, Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I brought you to curse my enemies, but you have done nothing but bless them. He answered, Must I not speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? What did he find out right here? God's in control, not him. God's in control. So he can't speak a curse upon God's people. Kind of like battling God. We're not going to win. He didn't win. He thinks, man, God's going to let me go on. I'm going to get to go on and do exactly what I set out to do. And I'm going to be able to be okay with God. And I'm going to get all the money. And then every time he opened his mouth, God just took a little bit more money away from him. A little bit more. Sooner or later, he's getting nothing out of the deal. Except glorifying God. Amen. No matter what we do, no matter what Balaam did, God was still in control through this whole thing. Even though he allowed Balaam to believe he was in control at the time. In the end, though, because the Momonites and the king continued their efforts to uh, tempt the people of Israel to dis dis disobey God and God's law, Moses commanded them his people, to attack them. And in that attack, we find in Numbers 31 that because of his sinful greed, Balaam was killed in the battle. So it didn't turn out very good for Balaam in the end anyway. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That scripture backs up exactly what happened to Balaam. Exactly what happened to Balaam. And exactly what can happen to us when we continue to go against God's will. When we find ourselves doing things that are not pleasing to God, not listening to God, and not following God's Word. We can wind up in that same mess. Talk about creating your own problem. There's probably not much of a better example than right here of how we can create our own problem by not listening to what God instructs us to do. There are three things we should take away from this message this morning. The first one, when temptation comes, we should run away from it. Turn with me to James, chapter 1, beginning at verse 13. James chapter 1, beginning at verse 13. It says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Your own evil desire of the flesh is what draws you away from God. First thing you should take away from here is run away from temptation. Don't fall into it. Second thing, 
When God speaks, we should listen. If you turn with me, we're going to Psalms. Chapter 32, verse 8. When God speaks, we should listen. Psalms 32, verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Now let's jump over to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21. Going too fast for you? Isaiah 30, uh, 21. Once again, when God speaks, we should listen. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Okay, we back that up with Scripture, amen? It's right there in our face. Okay, let's go to the third one. When God commands you, when God commands you, obey that command. Real clear, real clear. Deuteronomy chapter 13, get at verse 4. Deuteronomy, chapter 13, beginning at verse 4. Once again, when God commands you, obey that command. It is the Lord your God you must follow, and Him you must revere. Keep His commands and obey Him, serve Him, and hold fast to Him. Obey what God tells you to do. You know, when we say the sinner's prayer, we talk about we need to accept, we need to believe, and we need to commit. And people have trouble with that a commitment a lot. The word commit really bothers people. The same word here, obey, bothers people. I have many times when I'm going to do a wedding ceremony, and I sit down and to counsel with the couple, and the first thing the wife says is, I don't want that obey thing in there. Can you take that obey thing out of there? I said, yep. If I take it out, you need to go get somebody else to do your service. It's not going to be me. I just want to make sure you understand what that means. It doesn't make your husband a tyrant. It doesn't make your husband king of the castle or any of that. It's called respect. And that's what is expected out of the same thing for God. When you obey God, you respect God. Sometimes we have a hard time with that word. But once again, disobeying God, you create your own problem. Amen? Balaam's problem was not with misunderstanding what was going on here or a misinterpretation at all. That wasn't Balaam's problem. He had a problem with obedience. Golly, that's, I, that's, that happens all the time. That happens right here with all of us. We have a problem with obedience. Just like we look at our children and we reflect the same way. That's the way God looks at us. We're His children. And sometimes we have a problem with obedience. Once again, when we do that, we create our own problem. His obedience to God, it wasn't complete. It wasn't complete because we know he tried to obey God, but he also wanted to obey Balak so he could get the money. So that tells us that his obedience wasn't complete. And like I said, in cowboy church, we call that straddling the fence, and that's what he was doing. And he was just wavering around, trying to make God think that he's going to do one thing, and he really, God knew in his heart what he wanted to do, And God knew at the time what he was going to do. So he figured, well, he's going to do it anyway. Any kids do that? He's going to do it anyway, so I need to make this as difficult as I can for him. God does that to us. Same thing. He allows us, get that down, he allows us to go ahead and proceed. But then he puts that angel of the Lord standing in front of us, blocking our way. And sometimes we just need to open our eyes, as he did Balaam's, and see that the Lord sent an angel to block our way to keep us from the problem we're about to get in. So we don't create our own problem. 
the Bible's real clear that you can't serve two masters. Matthew 6, 24. Let's go there together. Let's read it together. Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now you wonder why God would just say, use money as an example right here, as the two masters. Because He knew in our lives that money was going to control our thoughts. And money was going to control many things that led us to a sinful way. So that's why he makes it real clear, choose one or the other. And God gives us a choice. God gives us a choice in every situation. You can choose to do right or you can choose to do wrong. I mean, it's your choice. I got tired of getting slapped in the back of the head, so I chose to do right. And it wasn't my wife doing it, even though it felt like it sometimes, but God said, Pay attention to me. Obey me. And I will bless you more than you'd ever believe. I want to be a witness to you. That has happened to me in my life. So many exciting things have just fell into place and it started right here. This morning my wife got on a plane to Colorado City. I'm sorry, Colorado Springs in Colorado. And uh, our son has been up there ever since he was 16 years old. He's played ice hockey, he's gone to school there, he's finished college. He lived with a host family for a time, and then he got out on his own. Next week is Mother's Day, I know. But I want to tell you something, there is nothing stronger, nothing more powerful except God than a praying mom. They get it done. We prayed and prayed, and our, my wife prayed that our son would run into the right girl, the right one for him in his life. He's well established up there. He's, he's made a career for himself, and he's doing very well. I don't pay for him anymore. I know that. That's the good part. But he ran into this girl. He's ran into many girls, but he ran into this one that me and mom like. She's a lot like my wife, Terry. She is an event organizer for a big hotel chain up in Denver, Colorado, where all the celebrities go. So she's got a good career on her own. But she's about as country as they come. Last night, listening to my wife talk up here and speak, my wife can speak. I mean, I told her she learned it all from me, but <laughs> my wife can get it done. And last night, listening to her, I thought I was country. That girl's country. When she goes to Colorado, they just stare at her. Like, where did you come from? But this girl is a good, she's the package. And my son's going to pro propose to her. This afternoon. Terry told him, said, don't you go proposing to this girl unless I'm there. And she's going, when she found this out, she's going through this. She's booking airlines. She's doing all this. And I said, Terry, did you bother to ask him? If he wanted you there, she goes, oh, he wants me there. <laughs> she goes, well, are you going? I said, well, I got a lot to do. He wasn't there when I proposed to you. Why not I got to be there now? <laughs> He'll get it done. And I'm glad she's going to be part of it. Keep her in the prayers on that. You know, I don't know what God might be calling you to do today. That's between you and God. But I do know that when we die to ourselves, remember that, that's a very important part, when we die to our own selves and the sinful life we have and we obey God, He blesses our lives and the lives of others around us in ways that it's hard to fathom. Die to yourself. Give up those sinful ways. This morning, if you're straddling that fence on something, let's get off the fence and seek to obey what God instructs us to do. And once again, don't create problems we don't need to have in our lives. All we have to do is put our face to God and ask for His help, and He'll make those paths clear. Amen? Let's pray.
Father God, we come to you this morning and we just lift this morning to you, Father. We thank you for your presence that we felt throughout this building. Father, we thank you for the favor that you continue to pour out here in your church house and on your church family. Father, we thank you for this new expansion, Father, that we're able to do to bring more people to know you. And we pray that it is your will and not ours, and that we are walking right there behind you. We thank you for all the miracles you've shown us that we're on the right path. And Father, we're thankful that we don't have someone there blocking it. Father, we know you're leading us in the direction we would go with this new building. And Father, we pray that you continue to bless that situation. Father, I pray that before we start creating problems in our lives that we create and bring upon ourselves, that we would obey you and that we would talk to you and walk in your word. And Father, take the time to listen to what it is you have to say to us. And then, Father, obey what it is you'd have us do. Father, I pray this morning that everything we said, everything we did, it was pleasing, uplifting, and glorifying to you. We ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.